and it's his debate. So the final item of business is the members' business debate on motion 8629, the name of Peter Chapman, on Holodomor, Remembrance Day 2017. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and can ask those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Peter Chapman to open the debate. Mr Chapman. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And firstly, I, I would also like to welcome the Ukrainian Ambassador, Mrs. Mrs. Natalia Galabarenko, and the Consul, Andrei Kuzli, who are sitting up in the, 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 uh, the gallery there today. And there are, very, uh, there are many friends of Ukraine, I think, in, the, in the, the chamber as well, sitting behind there. So welcome to you all. And I also need to say sorry for keeping you waiting for so long for, for this debate, uh, we have a habit of, of speaking far too long in this chamber, and, and apologies for that, but we are here now. And, and the Ambassador and Andre have to be thanked for bringing the topic of today's debate to my attention. Be before I first met with Andre here in Edinburgh, I had never heard of Holodomor before. And I'm sure some of you speaking in today's debate, debate had, not before, had not before signing my motion. And that is why this debate is so important. It is important that this tragic event is highlighted to let the world know the cruelty and the viciousness of Stalin and his regime. Now, Europe's recent history over the last 100 years or so is littered with war, conflict, and death. The First World War resulted in about 16 million deaths. And during the Second World War, some 60 million people were killed worldwide. But these conflicts are well known. The Holodomor is almost unknown outside the Ukraine, and it is time for that to change. The Holodomor is based on two Ukrainian words, holod, meaning hunger, starvation, and famine, and morito, moriti, meaning to induce suffering to kill. And from 1932 to 33, the Holodomor famine took from seven to 10 million innocent lives, many of them children. After the First World War and the fall of the Bolshevik regime, there was a downfall in the Russian Empire. This resulted in the abolition of censorship and the establishment of an independent Ukrainian state, and it allowed an astonishing renaissance of literary, literary and cultural activity. Many new writers and poets expressed their views on politics, and soon the people of Ukraine were working towards the elimination of illiteracy. They were becoming a smart nation, which did not sit well with Joseph Stalin. And in the summer of 1932, Stalin saw the resurgence of the Ukrainian as a threat. And in a letter to one of his main associates, he wrote, if we do not start rectifying the situation in, in Ukraine now, we may lose Ukraine. And there is a clear record of Stalin's government deliberate aims to inflict suffering on the people of Ukraine. He systematically planned their starvation and death to hold on to their land. And this began in the summer of 1932 when Stalin wrote a law now commonly, commonly known as the Law of Five Years of Grain. Ukraine was the most important agricultural part of the USSR. And despite only making up 2% of the USSR's total area, they harvested 23 million tons of grain, which was 28% of the gross grain harvest of the whole USSR. It was the breadbasket for Stalin's regime, and he used this to his advantage and subjected the nation to grain quotas, confiscating supplies down to the very last seed. All farmland became the property of the Soviet Union. Food in farmers' homes was taken and if they were caught taking food from the land they had owned, they would face fines, imprisonments, and even execution. And as they starved, it became hard, harder to harvest what the government requested, and the punishments worsened. From the implementation of the first grain quota, they became Soviet prisoners and Soviet slaves. And this suffering and starvation of the Ukrainian people was controlled through enforced isolation put in place to prevent starving peasants from going in search of food. A resolution passed by Stalin and the Soviet regime in January 1933 stated, 
a massive exodus of peasants in search of bread has started, without a doubt organized by the enemies of the Soviet government. Therefore, regional executive party bodies in Soviet Ukraine are ordered to prevent a massive exodus of peasants. Peasants from Soviet Ukraine who have crossed the borders to the north shall be arrested and deported back to their places of residence. It is recorded that the Soviet regime forcibly sent over 186,000 people back to their home to face certain starvation. We know that they systematically sent people back to their villages, knowing there was no food, knowing they would die a horrible, lingering death. As a result of the Holodomor, 20 to 25% of the population of Ukraine were exterminated. This enforced starvation reached, reached its peak in the winter, uh, winter and spring of 1932 into 33, when 25,000 people died every day. I repeat, 25,000 a day were dying at this point. And Maria Kachur, a survivor of the Holodomor, stated, my mother buried the children herself. When my brother was dying in February 1933, he pleaded for food. My older brother died in March and my sister in May 1933. This harrowing account shows what many families had to endure, the horror of parents burying their own children. The Holodomor had an extremely high mortality rate for children. In September 1933, approximately two-thirds of Ukrainian pupils were missing from schools. And many desperate parents would risk being caught by the Soviet secret police and take their children through the Ukrainian borders, abandoning, abandoning them in urban areas in hopes they would find more food there. Many, however, died on the street. One of the difficulties with the Holodomor is that the death toll has never been known for sure, with many families burying their own and mass graves in many villages. The head of the secret police of Ukraine wrote a letter in June 1933 stating, the mortality rate has been so high that numerous village councils have stopped recording deaths. After all these deaths, Stalin used the depleted and barren land to resettle thousands of families from Russia. And by the end of 1933, over 117,000 people were resettled in, in the Ukraine. Alain Besancon, a well-known French historian, has stated, it was the well-organized executions that made the terror by starvation in Ukraine a genocide. This sums up that the orchestrated and systematic killing of the Ukrainian people by the Stalin-led Soviet regime was a genocide, and we must recognize that those whose lives were destroyed by Holodomor. Presiding officer, like other massacres down through the years, we must not forget. We must remember them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Could I also welcome the consul whom I omitted, and could I ask members in the gallery to desist from clapping? I know why you want to, but it's not permitted. I call Maurice Golden to be followed by Claire Adamson. Mr. Golden, please. Thank you, presiding officer, and as I uh, previously intimated to you, my apologies that I have to leave shortly after my speech. Apologies to the chamber as well. Um, I too would like to offer my thanks to the Ukrainian ambassador and consul for highlighting this issue and indeed their presence here today. Everyone just thought of death. Those are the words of Nina Karpenko, one of the survivors of the Holodomor during an interview with the BBC a few years ago to mark the 80th anniversary of this genocide against the Ukrainian people. Although Holodomor is etched into the collective memory of the U Ukrainian people, it is largely unknown in the West. I thank Peter Chapman for helping to highlight that. But let us use today as an opportunity to ensure that more people understand what happened in Ukraine. The Holodomor was a man-made famine, the product of an evil and twisted Soviet regime that placed ideology and its grip on power above the welfare of its own people. As 
Alex I'll say that again, as Alexandra Rachenko, a teacher and eyewitness, put it, it would not be so offensive if it were due to a bad harvest, but they have taken away the grain and created an artificial famine. Estimates vary, a situation not helped by the decades of denial and secrecy, but somewhere in the region of four to 10 million innocent people perished in appalling suffering. The sad irony of Holodomor is that Ukraine was the breadbasket, its farmers producing more than a quarter of the grain harvest of the entire Soviet Union. How then could so many of its people die of starvation? In the late 1920s, Stalin began the process of collectivization, forcing farmers to hand over their land to Soviet authorities. Those who resisted were branded class enemies with armed troops and secret police used to enforce Stalin's will. Collectivization wasn't just a case of mass threat, theft by the Soviets, it was an assault on Ukrainian culture. By attacking the concept of the rural village, a key part of Ukraine's traditional culture. So the grain harvests were well below normal in 1932-33, and the Soviet response was to increase the grain quotas. And when farmers couldn't meet the quotas, Communist Party agents tore through Ukraine and took any food they could find. The result was, of course, famine. Pleas for help fell on deaf ears with Stalin writing that Ukraine has been given more than its due. Harsh laws made it difficult for people to help themselves. You could be shot for stealing a sack of wheat. The famine intensified and by 1933, tens of thousands of people were dying every day. The accounts are harrowing, people eating anything they could find to survive, people dropping dead in the streets, villages decimated. The Soviet response to this great loss of life amongst their own people was to export a million tons of grain to the West. Some did survive, though, like Nina Karpenko, and it's through their accounts that we can and we must recognise the Holodomor for the genocide it is and ensure that it is never forgotten and never repeated. Thank you, Mr. Golden. I call Claire Adamson to fall by Claire Baker. Ms. Adamson, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I want to, to let Mr Chapman know that I did know about the Holodomor before his motion um, and the reason I do so is that I have a Ukrainian friend, to my knowledge my only Ukrainian friend and he is in the gallery today, um, a former member of this place, Stefan Kimkovich and Councillor in Edinburgh Coun uh, Council. Uh, Stefan um, was the first person who ever told me about the history of the Ukrainian people and the Holodomor. Um, but having met with the, um, Her Excellency and the Consul General this afternoon, I'm sure that's a friendship group, group that will now grow. I also want to thank the diaspora of the Ukrainian people, many of whom are here today, for bringing the Holodomor exhibition to this parliament to help inform MSPs about um, what has happened and about their country and their family's history. It was very important to me to, to see that here in its place. A few years ago now, perhaps it's time for a re refresh and a revisit. Having known a little bit, not much about it, um, the Holodomor um, was something I'd heard about. And last year I visited uh, Canada and the United States with the presiding officer of this parliament on a parliamentary visit and was lucky enough to visit the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. It's the first museum in the world solely de dedicated to evolu the evolution, celebration and the future of human rights. And it, it's a profound experience to be there. It's a, an amazing place to visit and one that I will never forget because of the impact it had on me in so many areas. And in their Breaking the Silence gallery, they have exhibitions commemorating, remembering and informing people about the genocides of the world. And to my surprise, the Holodomor was included along with Rwanda, Srebrenica, the Holocaust 
and others. And my surprise was there because I was unaware that Canada had recognised the Holodomor as a genocide, something I think personally that this country should do as well. The Breaking Silence Gallery had a 10 minute long film showing footage from the time in the Ukraine and showing some of the posters and some of the uh, propaganda that was put out with the Soviets denying that there was any problem in the Ukraine. And it, it was a famine, it, the, the major part of which was 1932 to 33, but the Soviet Union's policies had damaged the Ukraine in 1925, 28 and 29. It was a catastrophic famine that swept across the, the Soviet Union and it began in the chaos of collectivism as have been mentioned by my colleagues. But the Soviet Union was also in denial and preventing the information about this reaching the West. And we have to thank um, journalists such as um, the Manchester Guardian's Malcolm Muggeridge, who at great risk to himself, defied the Soviets, went into the Ukraine, and because they sanitized the reports of reporters and, and things like famine and starvation, words were banned by the Soviets. They smuggled the real testimony of what was happening in the Ukraine to the West. Unfortunately, it didn't suit the political system here at the time. The Soviets were moving towards being our allies in what was to happen in World War II. And many, many people denied what was happening. In Muggeridge's own words, he said, what made it so diabolical is it was the deliberate creation of the bureaucratic mind without consideration, whatever, of the consequences in human suffering. My experience in Canada taught me, seeing all those genocides together, there is no limit to man's inhumanity to man. But we mustn't forget, we must remember, as we have in debates about Srebrenica, about the Holocaust here, but what's really important is that we write the unjust level of denial that still exists about the Holodomor, and I hope that one day that the UK will recognise it as a genocide. Thank you very much. I call Claire Baker to be followed by Tom Arthur. Ms Baker, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'd like to thank Peter Chapman for bringing forward today's debate, and I too would like to welcome the Ukrainian Ambassador to Parliament, Dobre Vercha, and I hope the pronunciation wasn't too bad. Uh, can I apologise at being unable to meet the Ambassador earlier on today as I had an urgent constituency meeting I had to attend, but I hope we have a, another opportunity to meet in the future. Um, I had to admit that until this debate was scheduled, I'm afraid I missed, we did have a previous debate in Parliament in the previous session that I, I had missed. I knew very little of the Ukrainian famine. I am sure that this is sadly true of many members and unfortunately much of Scotland. Uh, we rightly have extensive knowledge about the Holocaust, paying our respect to the victims each and every year. This Parliament has also had many debates and visits centred around the genocide in Srebrenica, as we remember the shocking deaths that took place in Europe all too recently. Yet the genocide at Holodomor has, as far as a quick check of the official report indicates, only had one very short debate. I hope that today is the beginning of Parliament's attempts to address this. As this is the 85th anniversary of Holodomor, we are at a stage where we are losing more and more the valuable, tragic, but at times very powerful memories and insights of those who experienced it. It is therefore up to us as politicians, along with historians, academics and Ukrainians, to ensure that these accounts and this tragedy does not die with them. Uh, my researcher, Jamie, recently became a dad. His son, Sam, is a quarter Ukrainian. Sam's great-grandparents on his mum, Amy's side, are survivors of Holodomor, survivors too of the Second World War in that region before they were able to seek refuge in England. Their daughter, Olga, then met and fell in love with a Scot and they made their home in Preswick. Um, Sam is six months old, but his Ukrainian grandparents, Walter and Mary, passed away before he was born. Yet for baby Sam and other Ukrainian Scots, it is as much part of their history as the Highland Clearances, just as Taras Shevenko is as much a part of their culture as Robert Burns. By calling the famine Holodomor to kill by starvation, it is a recognition that it was man-made. Starvation is often a consequence of war and conflict, 
but it can also be a deliberate act of aggression or control. If it is recognised as it has been man-made, then with 3.3 million deaths being considered a conservative estimate, it should be recognised as a genocide. Not just was Holodomor man-made, but when help was offered, it appeared to be turned away. Outside age was rejected, population movement was severely restricted, household foodstuff was confiscated, and a state propaganda campaign tried to turn urban against rural. According to the declassification of more than 5,000 pages of Holodomor archives by the Security Service of Ukraine, it is suggested that Ukraine was not given the state aid, sorry, it was not given the same aid and help that was given to other areas of the Soviet Union. The famine also took place against a backdrop described by genocide scholar Adam Jones of persecution, mass execution and incarceration clearly aimed at make undermining Ukrainians as a national group. There is a growing number that are calling for the UK government to recognise Holodomor as a genocide and call on them to show their support for the Ukraine, for the thousands of Ukrainians that fled the Soviet Union, for the thousands that have set up their homes across the UK and for the hundreds of thousands that are their descendants. Um, and as Claire Adams mentioned, Canada has recognised, I think so has Australia um, and Ukraine them, themselves. Um, today's debate is an opportunity to state our support for Ukrainian people and to recognise the calls for Holodomor to be recognised as a genocide. This terrible period in history must not be hushed up or downplayed. Genocide must be recognised as such in order to enable us to acknowledge the suffering, remember the dead and endeavour to ensure history does not repeat itself. Thank you very much. I call Tom Arthur, last speaker in the open debate. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wish to begin by thanking Peter Chapman for bringing this important debate to the Parliament. I would also like to join Mr Chapman in welcoming the Ukrainian Ambassador and members of the Scottish Ukrainian community to the Parliament and to express my solidarity with the people of Ukraine and the, U the Ukrainian state. This debate is important for several reasons. Firstly, it is important because it is important to remember if the Korean War was the forgotten war of the 20th century, the Holodomor was the forgotten genocide of the 20th century. And I want to recognize um, members who have used that word genocide, and it is encouraging to hear from across the chamber the recognition that the Holodomor was a genocide. And Mr. Chapman very eloquently explained that by citing historical sources highlighting the way in which the Ukrainian people and their culture were deliberately targeted. Presiding officer, we have a duty to make sure that more people are aware of this catastrophe. And I certainly will undertake to make sure that in my capacity as a constituency member that I engage with schools and my constituency of Renfrewshire South to increase awareness. Because there are several important lessons that I think emerge from this catastrophe, 85 years on. And that is one, is the way in which ideology taken to its extreme can dehumanize people. It is to use Burke's term, geometric politics, where individuals are subsumed into a collective, where people are instrumentalized and used as a vehicle for some other political end and individual liberty, liberty is lost. That, I believe was perhaps best captured in its most sinister form by that set of words often attributed to Stalin that a single death is a tragedy and a million deaths is a statistic. And even if such if that statement is apocryphal in its source, it sums up the, fundamental, the fundamentals of communist ideology. It sums up the ideology that led to something like the Holodomor taking place. Now, there is also an important lesson to be learned about how the Holodomor was reported and how it was forgotten and how we relearn about it. Because as all members have highlighted in their remarks, there, was a, there has been a, a profound lack of awareness. But there wasn't when it occurred. There was an enterprising, bold and brave young Welsh journalist by the name of Gareth Jones, who has been honored in Ukraine. Now, Gareth Jones didn't live to see his 30th birthday, but as a brilliant young man, 
fluent in French, German, and Russian, an aide to former Prime Minister David Lloyd George. He traveled to the Ukraine and he witnessed firsthand some of the scenes that other members have described. And he came back and he gave compelling testimony. And of course, what happened? The Kremlin denied it. Those with Soviet sympathies in the West poured scorn and discredited Mr. Well, uh, Mr. Jones. There was a lesson of actions emanating from Moscow and then attempts to discredit it by Moscow and people in the West being sympathetic to the Kremlin line. A lesson 85 years ago, but it's still very valid. And what happened to Gareth Jones is he regained his reputation and he went to Japanese occupied Mongolia to report an event there. And he died in mysterious circumstances. But two of the last people he met were Stalin's NKVD agents. And there's a lesson there to be learned as well. But I officer, if I may just in concluding say that this year may represent the 85th year, the anniversary of the Holodomor. But it is also the 10th anniversary of the Prague Declaration on European Conscience and Communism, from which we have a European Day of Remembrance for victims of Stalinism and Nazism. We all have a duty, both in this place and in our work in our constituencies, to make sure that prominence is given to the victims of Holodomor and that future generations will never forget because fundamental to this are the words of George Santanyana. Those who do not know the past are condemned to repeat it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Alistair Allen to close the government. Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like uh, to thank all the members who have contributed to this afternoon's debate marking the 85th anniversary of the Holodomor. The Scottish Parliament debated this horrific tragedy in Parliament in 2014, and by doing so again, I am in no doubt that it will have raised awareness of this terrible event in the Ukraine's history. Can I thank Mr Chapman uh, for bringing this motion to Parliament and take this opportunity, like others, uh, to welcome the Ukrainian ambassador and her party to the gallery today. Uh, we are honoured um, that you are able to be with us. Now, the message today has been very clear that the Holodomor was a completely avoidable tragedy and one which serves as a reminder of the depths of inhumanity that can exist in this world. And it is by continuing to debate and above all commemorate the tragedy that we show our solidarity with the people of Ukraine and come together across parties to remember those lost as part of this deplorable famine which could so easily have been prevented. The people of Scotland and Ukraine have intertwined histories and uh, Ukrainians continue to very positively influence Scottish society. This is reflected by the shared celebration of our two national poets, Robert Burns and Taras Shevchenko, which is hosted by the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain every year. One of the most visible gifts to Scotland from the people of Ukraine came from Ukrainian prisoners of war who made Scotland their home in the first half of the 20th century resulting in the Holmuir Ukrainian Chapel near Lockerbie. The Scottish Government places a very high value indeed on the ongoing contribution of the Ukrainian community to Scotland as a whole, and we are very grateful for the chance to unite in commemoration today. I want to say uh, a little, uh, as others have, about the sequence of events that we're commemorating. In 1924, Joseph Stalin ascended to power in the USSR. In 1928, he introduced an agricultural program of government-owned farms and factories. And as Claire Adamson mentioned, a bureaucracy was set up um, to develop uh, the ideology around that uh, and to, um, uh, to oppose uh, very violently any social groups uh, that Stalin decided were in the way of that plan. In 1929 and 1930, uh, groups which were considered um, by Moscow to be dangerous uh, or members of society that were not uh, uh, of the same way of thinking as Moscow were rounded up and sent to Siberian work camps. 
1932 and 1933, production quotas for Ukraine increased by some 44%, causing widespread hunger and starvation, something which amounted to an attack on the whole people and culture of the Ukraine. Now, given this sequence of events, uh, I wholeheartedly understand the basis for the calls across this chamber to designate the Holodomor as a genocide. These are essentially criminal matters on which appropriate courts, such as the International Criminal Court, are best placed to make a judgment, taking into account uh, all of the great deal of evidence that exists. And that's why it remains our position, shared by the UK government, that the recognition of genocide is a matter for judicial decision rather than government policy. But the fact that we, along with the UK government and the European Parliament, take that view in no way lessens our horror at the severity and inhumanity of the Holodomor and the enormity of suffering and loss of life it very deliberately caused. Nor does it lessen our recognition that the policies and political decisions taken at the time by the then Soviet leadership were responsible for the famine resulting in the deaths of millions of Ukrainians. The scale of this tragedy is truly staggering by any measure. By 1933, as we've heard, the death rate had reached 25,000 people a day, most of these children, and by the end, millions of lives had been lost. It is no exaggeration, therefore, to say that the Holodomor is one of history's starkest warnings and marks a devastating chapter in world affairs that must never be forgotten. It has been 85 years since the beginning of the Holodomor, and in every one of those years, people across the world have worked to honour those who died. Therefore, it is important that we also take uh, the opportunity today to pay tribute to the people who continue to work to keep alive the memory of all those who perished in the Holodomor. I know I speak for everyone across the chamber and across Scotland when I say that we will continue to stand with the people of Ukraine uh, to share in their mourning and to stand in solidarity with the terrible events that they commemorate. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.